Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to message number one in this new series called Heart to Heart in the Holy of Holies. I am so excited about the opportunity to share all this with you. This is something I've been passionate about for decades and really never could get a release in my heart to share very much about it. I shared bits and pieces over the years, but today I want to talk to you about, about being heart to heart with God, learning how to come into this heart to heart connection. You know, we have a, this very extensive program called uh, Heart Physics, where we where we teach people to recognize the presence of God in their own life and hear his voice in their heart, follow his voice in their heart. Now, here's the most interesting thing about this. No one can actually teach another person how to hear God in their own heart. That's something that has to emerge out of their own passion, out of their own hunger for God, out of their own desire to have meaningful communication with God. And But it also gets into the whole concept of being absolutely 100% real with God, holding absolutely nothing back from God. You know, when we look later on at the Holy of Holies uh, in, in the Temple of Solomon, we find something very, very interesting. And by the way, let me say, we will be talking some about the, about the temple because the Bible says we are the temple of God. You notice it doesn't say we are the tabernacle of God. The tabernacle is what Moses built in the wilderness. Now, the temple, which uh, was built by Solomon under the supervision of David, had very, everything was precise. Everything was exact. Everything about the temple Every piece of furnishing in it, every formal ritual that took place in the temple actually had been had been uh, described to David by God, and David passed that on to Solomon, his son. Now, sadly, Solomon didn't have the heart for God that, that David had. But what's really, really interesting is in this temple that God built, and later on we'll probably look at some, some pictures of the temple, but in this temple there were chambers that were designed for the priests to be able to store all of the utensils that they used in their worship of God. But as time went by and as the priesthood became more and more corrupt, actually these chambers that were built to hold the treasures of God and all the artifacts of God, all the holy utensils of God, actually became the place where the priest uh, hid their their idols, hid the objects of their worship, hid the, the objects with which they participated in, in idolatry against God. And the temple became totally, totally corrupt. And in their minds, and the prophet Ezekiel addresses this, in their minds, God didn't see these things. These were hidden from God. They had them hidden from the people. Therefore, they somehow, I guess, assumed that they if they had them hidden from God. Now, I want to just tell you this. Whether you're talking about marriage, whether you're talking about friendship, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Any, any place where there is going to be uh, intimate relationships or deep interaction, uh, there are several things that have to happen. First of all, there has to be absolute sincerity and honesty. Otherwise, there can be no heart-to-heart -heart connection with another person or with God. Now, remember, your heart is the seat of everything that, that we are. It's the real us. It's part soul, part spirit. It's where everything that's real about us comes together and manifests, it's, uh, manifests as our character and our nature and all that we are, all that we believe, all that we will do with our entire lives. And so, if we're not 100% real with God, then the truth is we are never actually connecting to him heart to heart. And so in this whole series, we're going to be talking about connecting to God, and we're going to be talking about how God showed us through the tabernacle uh, and through the temple and through, particularly through the worship in the Holy of Holies, how we come into heart to heart connection with God. Now, let me say this. First of all, so very important. God always wants and always initiates intimate heart-to-heart -heart communication. You know, Jesus made this interesting statement about 
about basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, but, but basically he says, you know, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And now I find that to be so incredibly interesting. And I think there are times that people get a little confused about what that means. And, and they think that that gets into some type of predestination and where God chooses certain people and he leaves certain people out. But maybe as much as anything, when Jesus talks about the fact that he chose us, it's, it's about the fact that he himself actually created us to be who he wanted us to be. He created us to be able to function like no other species that exists in all of creation. We have the capacity to have a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God, unlike the animals, unlike the angels, unlike the cherubim, unlike anything that exists in heaven and earth. There is nothing in all of creation like the human race that is uniquely designed to be intimate with God. And the real truth is, if we do not fulfill our need for intimacy in our relationship with God, very possibly that's going to end up being corrupted. It's going to take us down a path of something that leads us into sin and destruction because we're trying to meet a need that can only be met in this intimate, intimate connection with God. You know, one of the first, I mean, there, there's so many places we could go. We could go straight to the Garden of Eden. Uh, but I, I want to talk just a little bit about Moses and the children of Israel whenever they, they came out of Egypt. Now, remember, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, making a journey into the promised land is a type, it is a shadow. It is a model not only of the church uh, of uh, corporate, uh, of the, the entire body of Christ, but it's actually a model for individual believers to look at and to understand and to learn from their mistakes and their failures so that we don't have to go through those same mistakes and failures, but also to learn from their, from their good decisions and, under, and, and not have to do everything by trial and error, not have to fall and get up and fall and get up and fall and get up and figure it out, sort it out. God said, listen, I'm going to record all this. It's kind of interesting. The Apostle Paul, in fact, says that all of these things, everything that's in the Old Testament was written as a type or an, in, or an example to us upon whom the end of the ages have come. Now, stop and think about that. We, God is so desirous to have a meaningful relationship with us that he has he recorded everything that, that was significant from the time of creation through the life of Christ, through the early church, so that we could avoid all of those mistakes, so that we could learn from the things that they did in a healthy, godly way. But it, it's amazing that, that somehow religion has cheated us out of our ability to look at that and to see that and to find God in it. We've turned it into a religious mess uh, that, that because of how it's been twisted, it seems like nobody can really understand it. You know, one of the things that the ancient Hebrews looked for when they read the scripture was patterns. Instead of trying to identify and explain each event that happened in the Bible in light of that one specific event, they would look at everything that happened in, in the history of the nation of Israel, and they would say, now, what are the patterns here? What do we habitually see uh, whenever we read the history of God's interaction with man? Well, I'll tell you one of the things that I see right off the bat, I see that God is the initiator of intimacy with the human race. I see that he created us to have a capacity to relate to him like no other species could ever relate to him, and to spend our lives in deep intimacy and actually to have this connection with him that we never lose, this bond that is so sure that we can always hear his voice, we can always have his direction, we can always have his leadership, we can always experience his protection. I tell you, God wants so much more for us than we expect from him and really, he is the one that initiated all of this. You know, everything that God has done for us through the Lord Jesus was, was predestined. Now, it wasn't predestined in the sense that God decided every individual thing for every individual person. 
because every person has a free will. Every person has to make their own choices. But what God did decide in advance that everything that we would ever need for life and godliness, everything that we would ever need to live this incredible life here on planet Earth, that we would find this through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that Jesus himself would become the focal point of all eternity. So I see God as the initiator. I don't see God as someone that's hard to find. I do know this, though. I do know that the scripture tells us that you'll search for me, and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And I do realize that many, many times we search for God in more of a half-hearted way. We actually, we're not sure what we're doing. We're not sure what to look for. We're not sure how all of this is going to play out. And so the end result is we kind of have this half-hearted pursuit of God, and therefore we, we're not looking for him with all of our heart. Uh, and, and so we don't recognize him. We don't experience him. And the book of Exodus is so very interesting. Children of Israel, they've already come out of Egypt. Uh, God is trying to teach them his word. He's trying to teach him his character. You know, you know I was reading, I, I was just reading yesterday in the, in the book of Deuteronomy over uh, in, in Deuteronomy 27. And it's, it's really, really interesting that whenever God gave a, a, a review of all of the commandments, it's really interesting. He did not say that these commandments would make them righteous. He said these commandments would make them holy. And you, you're, you're like, well, 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 what's the difference? You know, righteousness is to be pure, is to be justified, is, is to be un unadulterated, is to be non-polluted. But even more than that, righteousness is where we come into this realm where we are living and existing the way God actually created us to live and, and exist. You say, well, then what's holiness? Well, holiness is where we are uncommon. We are unlike the world. We're unlike any other religion. We're, like, uh, we're unlike any other occult. We're unlike any, any other faith. We're unlike anything else. And so, so it's kind of interesting. God, God didn't say, as a matter of fact, he, he said that keep, you couldn't keep all of the law. You, you know, nobody could live up to it. That's why every person had to come to God by faith and that the righteous have always lived by faith. Hosea 2.4 tells us that if you're walking in righteousness, you're walking in faith righteousness because there is no righteousness that a person can earn in their own capability. But what's interesting is he explained to them, he said, now, if you, if you will have value for my commandments and you'll treat one another according to my commandments, then you will be holy like I'm holy. People will see me in you. I find that so incredible. God's more interested in us being like him than he is in us trying to be perfect and flawless. Now, he gives us the gift of righteousness. We are positionally and legally as righteous as we're ever going to get. Now, we can functionally, we can grow in that righteousness by faith because we, because we commit ourselves to the Lord. But holiness is a real, another, another thing. Holiness is all about walking in love, about being different, about being unlike any religious anything in all of the whole world. And so God wants us to be holy so that the world will look at us and see in the way that we treat one another, they will see who God is and how God is. So it's kind of interesting and important that we be able to make that very subtle difference in the uh, between righteousness and holiness. And if I'm going to seek God with all of my heart, and I don't understand some of these subtle differences, the real truth, I'm going to get confused. And I'm going to end up in some kind of religious mess. The Lord is, is trying to prepare the people to receive the commandments and to, and to move on from Mount Sinai and get across the Jordan and enter into what would be a type of the kingdom of heaven, and where all of our needs are met, where all our, our resources are fulfilled. Now, on this way, you know, when Moses is up on the mountain, they get into idolatry. Uh, you know, all kinds of corrupt things happen in this process. But it's very, very interesting that uh, Moses actually 
uh, seeks God out. He he doesn't wait for a formal invitation from God. Now, yeah, when God calls him up on the mountain, yes, he waits for a formal invitation. But other than that, Moses makes up his mind that he is going to know God. But more than that, he makes up his mind that God, uh, he's going to understand God. He, he doesn't want to just know what God will do. He doesn't want to know just how powerful God is. He wants to know God is. He wants to know the character and the nature of God. So in, in, in Exodus 33, we have this information that tells us about Moses building uh, what was called the tent of meeting. He set up a tent, and he would go out into this tent, and he would seek God. And what's interesting, verse uh, 13 of, Mo of Exodus 33 so Moses says, now I pray if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you. Man, I don't know about you, but that just re that just ha has a resounding expression in my heart. You know, Psalm 103, and I can remember as a new believer reading this. I mean, within the first you know year that I was saved, reading and pondering on this scripture to great extent psalm 103 verse 7 it says that god made his uh made known his ways to moses and his acts to the children of israel well why did moses have the opportunity to learn and come to know god's ways but the children of israel only became to know god's acts or god's deeds or god's actions well the difference is Moses was seeking a heart-to-heart -heart intimate relationship with him. Moses wanted to know God. Moses believed that God was understandable. And you know that's something that not many people in the whole church world believe today. Most people do not believe that God is understandable. Well, I think God has gone out of his way. He has given us a recorded history. He's given us hundreds of prophecies, uh, many of which have already come to pass to the letter hundreds more that will, actually thousands more that will come to pass uh, as we get closer and closer and closer to the return of the Lord Jesus. He has, he has given us his word. He's given us all of his names. He has given us the life, the teaching, the ministry, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. He has made a covenant with us called the covenant of peace, whereby we understand what the arrangement is with him. We should be able to know him we should be able to always anticipate what he is going to do. Now, there may be specifics that he's going to lead us in that maybe as of yet, he has not really spoken to us about the specifics, but we always know that he's going to be the deliverer. He's not going to be the destroyer. We know he's always going to be the healer. He's not going to be the herder. We always know he's going to be the provider. He's not going to be the thief. We always know he's going to be the protector not the pain bearer. And so there's all these things that we can know about God. But here is the interesting thing. Until we connect to him heart to heart, until we have just stripped away everything and just said, look, God, here I am. I'm giving you all of me. I'm surrendering all of my life to you. I want to know you. I want to understand your ways. I want to know how to follow you. And I want to abide in your presence. Until we come to that place where, like Moses, we just set our hearts fully on this, then the real truth is we're not, going to, we're not going to be able to grasp exactly what it is that he's saying. We're not going to be able to grasp exactly what it is uh, that, that, that he's trying to show us and trying to reveal to us. We'll get our mental, intellectual uh, capacities wrapped up in this instead of our heart-to-heart -heart capacities. Now, let me say this. I've got an incredible eight message. Uh, series, audio series, that goes along with this incredible uh, video series that I'm, that I'm sharing with you today. And I'm, we're going to be talking and going into, into deep, deep, deep depth in this about understanding how to connect with God, understanding how to have that heart-to-heart -heart connection. And again, like I said, I can't really teach you how to do it. I can, I can share things with you. I can, I can help lead you down a pathway that ultimately comes to the door of your heart. But at the end of the day, it's going to have to be you who goes in 
and you are going to have to be the one to meet with God, and you are the one that's going to have to open your heart up and 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 make yourself ready to hear everything that God wants to teach you about life, about you, about Him, about your future, about your destiny. Now, this is really interesting. In, in Exodus 33, it says that Moses, in verse 7, says Moses would take the tent, this tent that he used for a tent of meeting, and he would pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp, and he called it tent of meeting. And it came about that everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, uh, which was outside the camp. Thus, the Lord would speak face to face with Moses, just as a man speaks to his friend. And so when Moses would return to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Now, this is so very crucial here, uh, where it talks about God meeting with him face to face, like, and talk to him in a way that a person would actually normally speak to their friends. Now, Jesus wants to bring us into friendship with, with himself and, and with the Father. Uh, even though we will always be servants, it doesn't mean that servants are the highest aspect of our, of our relationship with him. You know, in John 15, verse 12, Jesus said, this is my commandment that you love one another. Now, this particular word here for love is, uh, is, is one that, that uh, implies uh, th this deep connection, this deep commitment, this willingness to give yourself to someone. And, and he goes on and says this. He says, greater love has no one than this, than that they lay down their life for their friends. Now, he said, I'm, I'm going to show you what it means to be a friend. And, you know, I have heard people read these passages of Scripture and just somehow or another reach the idea that uh, that we're no longer servants. Well, you know, the Apostle Paul identified himself as a servant all the way until the end of his life. But like I said, there are levels of having a relationship with God, just like there are many different dimensions in having a relationship with your spouse, many different dimensions in having a relationship with your friends and with your children. There are a lot of different dimensions in, in our relationship with God. And one of the relationships that we have with them, yes, is a servant. There are things that we do because we choose. We, we are not, we, we're not forced into servitude, but because we value what he has done for us, there are things that we choose where, where we actually function in his capacity as servant. But in the deepest level of where our life is affected the most, it's all about friendship. So he says, now you're my friends if you do what I command to you, uh, what I command to you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, this is something that becomes very, very interesting. You know, a servant never really understands uh, or doesn't necessarily understand why the master wants them to do what they do. And one of the difference between a servant and a friend is that the master will ask a friend to perform a duty, but one of the differences is the master will teach or explain to the friend why this duty is important. He will, he will speak to him about his ways, not just about the things that he's doing. And so our call to, to connect to, to God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is to connect with him as friends, people who are 100% sold out to him, people who open, you know, we open ourselves heart to heart, we have honest communication with him, and, and he can say anything to us, he can correct us, he can lead us, he can teach us, he can, he, he can do anything that he feels like he needs to do. And out of the end of that, we actually come to understand his ways, not just become people who are witnesses of the many, many things that he does. Now, one of the interesting things about, and, and we will, we're going to talk about this in great depth, and a very exciting message that's going to be coming up, is that, is that 
the word that is used in the Hebrew about God uh, speaking to Moses uh, is is the Hebrew word dabar or dabar. Now, dabar is an interesting word because uh, e even though dabar could include speaking verbally, just like you know, you know, you might speak verbally to your wife or to your child, but what makes the difference is are you speaking out of your heart or are you just transferring information? Well, the word devar or debar indicates that God, when speaking to Moses, was speaking from his heart, which means Moses could only hear it in his heart, which means that God is always speaking, seeking to speak to us in a deeper level, a deeper capacity, a most powerful way that could influence us so that we don't just gather information, so that we don't just, just you know, it's not a matter of just putting the right answer on the test. It is a matter of, of shaping who we are as people. And this is what happens when we spend time in the presence of God. And this is so incredibly important. When we spend time in the presence of God, communicating heart to heart, this is where effortless transformation takes place. And this is where we become like him because we perceive him as he really is. We perceive his ways, not just his actions, not just his, not just his deed. You know, there have been hundreds of thousands of people the world over who have seen people get healed uh, in a meeting, uh, in a church meeting or by somebody ministering to somebody. But what's amazing is very few of those people really expect God to be the healer and expect God to always want to heal. Why? Because they saw his ways, but they never really connected with God, the healer, in a heart-to-heart -heart relationship to understand why healing is so very important. You can use, and I'm just using healing as one of many topics. Listen, we're going to be talking about some incredible things about connecting to God heart-to-heart, -heart, about uh, about the value of the Holy of Holies, how what that means to us, what we can learn about connecting with God. So be sure download the audio uh, series, jump in this, and I will be back with you next week. Share this with everybody that you think it will help. Mm -hmm.